I'm Cheryl Miller, director of the Hurtog Foundation, and I'm excited to host you for a conversation um, that I hope will give you a teaser of the Hurtog experience. On our format for this evening, we'll begin with an overview of two summer fellowships, security studies and war studies. I'm going to handle the security studies program and then Brian Babcock Lumish, who's here with us um, and is part of the Institute for the Study of War. He's going to talk about the war studies program for which he is one of the many illustrious faculty. So let's talk about security studies. This program is comprised of three week long seminars. This is a choose your own adventure kind of program. So you can apply to as many seminars as you'd like and as fits your um, interest and also schedule. So you can apply to one, two or all three of the programs. And it's also possible be, to be selected for all three or just one or two. Unfortunately, you cannot do war studies and security studies at the same time, which may become as a disappointment. Unfortunately, the dates overlap for these programs and so unless you have managed a way to be physically present in two places at one time, it's not going to be possible. You can, however, put your hat in the ring for both programs, um, and that's just with one application. Although I do want to stress there are some important differences about the application requirements for war studies and security studies, and Brian is going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, security studies is a full-time residential program. We will host you in a downtown DC hotel, provide you a stipend to offset your travel and living costs. And in return, we expect your full participation in our seminars, um, which will have morning and afternoon activities. Notably, um, security studies is open, not just to college students and recent graduates, but also to young professionals. So if you're a young professional who's disappointed that you can't apply to um, war studies because you don't meet the eligibility, this is the program for you. Um, Brian, if I can have the next slide, please. Thanks. Our first security studies seminar oh, uh, it runs over July 24th to July 28th. It will be taught by two instructors who you see their um, wonderful profile pictures here, Congressman Mike Gallagher, um, who leads the House Select Committee on China and Aaron McLean, a fellow for the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and a former um, top advisor to Senator Tom Cotton. And they're going to be teaching a book that's been really influential to um, Congressman Gallagher, um, T.R. Farabach's um, classic military history of the Korean War, that kind of war, I'm sorry, this kind of war. Um, as the last time American and Chinese troops met on the battlefield, um, the Korean War has much to tell us today about great power competition with China. Next slide, please, Brian. Our second security studies seminar runs over July 31st to August 4th. Um, Dan Blumenthal, a senior fellow at AEI and a collaborator with the ISW team, um, in particular war studies faculty, Fred Kagan, will continue our study of China, examining the past and future of Chinese warfare. So fellows will examine China's past and current use of force in the context of its strategic culture and traditions. And they'll assess some of these big questions of today, the threat of a Taiwan invasion and the possibility of a hot war between the US and China. Brian, next slide. Our final security study seminar will run from August 6th to August 11th. It will be led by Vance Surchuk, a fellow at the Center for a New American Security and director of the KKR Global Institute where he advises General David Petraeus also involved with the war study. So you're beginning to see it's a conspiracy. Um, Vance's course will study the trajectory of US policy toward Russia um, from the Soviet collapse to the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. So that's a little bit about security studies. Please feel free to start sending questions. Um, Brian is gonna take over now and talk about the war studies program. Great, Cheryl, thanks so much. So to talk about the war studies program, as Cheryl mentioned, this does overlap with the same dates as the security studies program. It begins July 28th and runs through August 12th for two weeks. And when we call it an intensive two week program, we do mean intensive. Uh, this is where you will be in seminar eight hours a day and have sometimes as much as 300 pages of reading a night. Um, now, similar to the security studies program, we it is full time and residential here in Washington, D.C. We put you up in a hotel. We provide all your meals and we give you a stipend. Now, our 
selection criteria is a little bit more restrictive than security studies in that it's only open to classes of 2023, 2024, and 2025 from undergrad. So if you're already in grad school, then security studies is for you. But if you're an undergrad who either graduates this spring or in the next couple of years, then more studies could be the right program for you. As far as how our syllabus is structured, we have both morning and afternoon sessions of four hours of seminar each. And then in the evenings, the expectation is that you'll be doing your reading for the next day um, and also doing sort of exercises and work with your uh, group outside the classroom. And we provide a study space for you even in the evenings to use at the hotel. What we're really trying to do with the War Studies program is bridge the civil military divide. Uh, this program goes back 10 years, and we essentially want to ensure that there are civilians versed in the language and logic of war, so that when you're in a position of responsibility someday as a civilian, you can actually help hold the military accountable uh, for what we do, and that there is a healthy civil military dialogue. The way we do that is we, we take a a long duration approach to it, where we start with Napoleonic warfare as the foundational understanding of sort of battles and how things work from the tactical to the strategic and grand strategic. Um, and then we go from that all the way through to the future of war. So we do things like the, like, uh, the theorist Clausewitz. We understand uh, the First World War, the Second World War, uh, we talk about the evolution of doctrine and the piece of the program that always gets rave reviews from the students is we take you to Gettysburg and do what's called a staff ride where each uh, group is divided up into teams. And what happens is you're responsible for becoming an expert on a particular aspect of the campaign or the battle or a particular commander. And then you have to explain to your peers what was going on in the mind of that commander on the spot that they were on the battlefield as they saw the battle unfold. And it really brings to life uh, what you've been reading about in the books when you're actually walking around on the battlefield and understanding the way in which uh, the campaign unfolded in 1863. When it comes to the faculty, uh, my boss, Dr. Kim Kagan, is the president of the Institute for the Study of War. She founded ISW 15 years ago and 10 years ago created the War Studies uh, program. Uh, she's joined by her husband, Fred Kagan, uh, who's over at the American Enterprise Institute, and then General Jim Dubik, who he has a long career as a practitioner. Uh, he commanded everything from a platoon, which is about 20 to 30 people, all the way up to a corps, which was 48,000 soldiers under his command at First Corps out uh, in Washington State. And he's a political philosopher. Um, and so he, he brings expertise in just war theory to the conversation. And Kim and Fred are both Yale trained military historians. Uh, and then I joined them as part of the, the core faculty. And my background uh, is that I'm a political scientist by training, uh, did my PhD in war studies at King's College London and had 24 years in uniform as a military intelligence officer in the US Army. We're also joined though, by a number of illustrious outside guest speakers. Um, and all six of them that I'm showing here on the screen, General Scaparotti, General Petraeus, General McChrystal, General Allen, General Nagata, General McMaster, they're all confirmed for this summer. Um, so each of them will come out. Um, General Allen will actually join us a couple of different times, uh, but then each of the others will come out for typically two to three hours to do an in-depth seminar sharing their experience with very senior leadership in uniform. And there's lots of time for Q&A with them. Uh, and you really get a chance to learn from them about lessons in leadership at the highest levels of the military. So that's a little bit about the, the war studies program itself. Now I'm gonna talk about the application process. So of course, one thing you can't forget is the deadline. It is due on the 1st of March. So make sure to get your applications in on time. Have, if, if you're applying to a program that requires letters of recommendation, that those are submitted on time, right? Don't wanna to have to be chasing down letter writers after the deadline, um, but it's due on the 1st of March. As Cheryl talked about before, even if you're applying to more than one program, it's only one application 
and you submit it at the Hertog Foundation website, hertogfoundation.org. Um, there's not an application page on the Institute for the Study of War website, even though we're the ones who conduct the Hertog War Studies program. So you submit just a single application. Um, if you're selected as a finalist, then you move on to an interview round where for security studies, you'll interview with Cheryl. For war studies, you'll interview with me. Uh, and that's a 30 minute interview uh, in either case. Uh, and that's the, the selection process. Um, it is possible if you're applying to other HERTOG programs that you could do more than one program, as Cheryl talked about a little bit earlier. It's possible to do more than one program in a summer. The application has six components. There's the basic application form, a resume or CV, your transcript, and then the next pieces I'll talk about a little bit more in depth in subsequent slides, the statement of purpose and the writing sample. So when it comes to the statement of purpose, don't just turn your resume into several paragraphs, right? That's actually not helpful. What we want is an explanation of why it is you want to actually take this course, whether security studies or war studies. How is it that that experience fits in with where you've come from and where you want to go? Where do you see yourself in the future and how will this help prepare you for that trajectory? Um, if you're applying to both programs, don't submit two statements of purpose. You only submit one for your first choice program. And we'll consider you for both programs if you tick the box for both, um, but you only have to submit one statement of purpose. As far as the writing sample, for security studies, it's up to a 10 page maximum. For war studies, we allow up to 20 pages. Now for both programs, we say, send us your best writing, not necessarily, a, if, if you wrote a paper on international relations for a political science class you have, that's nice, but if it's not your best writing, send us your best writing. I mean, last year when I was looking at applications for uh, the war studies program, one of my favorite writing samples was actually a feminist approach to understanding the role of the princess in Disney movies. Not something you would have expected as an application to the War Studies program, but it was a fantastically written piece and she ended up being a great member of the program. So like I said, give us your best writing, not things that are necessarily topical to the area. Although if those happen to overlap, that's great. When it comes to your references and letters of recommendation, the War Studies program requires two letters of recommendation. If you're nominated for security studies, you don't have to have a letter of recommendation. It's just the nomination, and then you have to include a reference, uh, but not a letter of recommendation uh, for if you're nominated, sponsored, or an expedited applicant. So as I said, applications are due the 1st of March. Um, and we look forward to reviewing them, whether you're applying to one of the programs or both. Um, and at this point, we'll, we'll open it up to the questions. Terrific. And Jess, um, it has somebody up for us. I believe it's Jonathan Davi Santos who has a question. It takes him a few seconds to materialize, so we will be patient. And there's Jonathan appearing now. Hello. Hi, hey, Jonathan. Hey. We can Thank hear you. you. All right. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, the first one was, um, what are the costs of, uh, that as an as an applicant I am expected to to uh, to take uh, if I'm accepted into the program? So I know flight tickets are one of them, and that the accommodation is is um, is covered. But what else is it expected to? Jonathan, are so, you interested in war studies or security studies? War studies, sorry. Okay, so you go ahead, Brian. Sure. So for the war studies program, there are no costs to the participants. In addition to us funding your trip, your tickets, putting you up at a hotel, providing you three meals a day, we then also give you a fifteen hundred dollar stipend. So you actually make money studying war. It's not. There's no cost to you. Yeah, and that's true of all our programs, which is we provide residential, we provide some meals, um, we provide you with all course materials. Obviously, you have a full scholarship to the entire program. So the idea is that we want to support as many students um, study as we can. 
And my 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 second question was, when it comes to the unofficial transcript, if it was okay for it to be provided at, in the in the native language, or if it should be translated beforehand. I'm going to say it should be translated beforehand. What do you? <laughs> yes, because yes. I don't read Brazilian Portuguese. <laughs> So yes, and you would, might include it as well. Yeah, you could include the original as well um, in the language and then provide the translation. That would be great. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. All right. I have a question um, for you, Brian, um, from an anonymous attendee. And it says, is this program meant to be bipartisan, apolitical, or does it intentionally lean right? No, we absolutely... Um, the Institute for the Study of War itself is very much nonpartisan, bipartisan. Like we we are objective observers of war as a human phenomenon. And we want students from across the political spectrum. We want students who have all different uh, perspectives, whether that's what academic major. And I, I didn't mention this, but a lot of people assume that we just want political scientists and historians. And in fact, what we want is um, methodological and academic disciplinary diversity in the classroom as well. We love it when there's a philosopher, an anthropologist, an economist, a mathematician, right? We want people who bring every possible perspective and are just broadly interested in understanding uh, war as a human phenomenon from whichever vantage point they're, they're coming to it from. Yeah, and I would just second that. That's definitely true as well of the other Hertog programs um, that we have on offer. Um, we have students with a diversity of opinions um, coming to the program, get a lot out of it. Um, and we're also looking for students across the curriculum with different backgrounds, um, different interests, because that's going to make the most interesting conversation around the seminar table. All right. Um, Brian, I've got a question for you about War Studies letters of recommendation. So War Studies, um, and I want to stress, requires two letters of recommendation from all applicants. And this is true even if you've been nominated. Um, you really, All War Studies applicants need to submit those two letters. But somebody wants to know, is it best to obtain two letters from professors or um, should could they um, submit a letter from a work supervisor or other mentor? Both are fine. Um, what we... What I want to see in the letters of recommendation is people who can speak to you as a person and how you will be as a member of a cohort, right? Are, are, you, a, are you a good student, of course, is part of that. Um, are What you bring, how are you in the classroom? But it's not just that because um, the Hertog War Studies program sits within the wider Petraeus Center for Emerging Leaders. So if you have a work letter of recommendation that talks about your leadership ability in whatever sort of work environment you're in, well, that actually fits within what we're looking for as well, that we're trying to pick future leaders in national security. So it's fine if one of the two is, is not an academic letter, by all means. Great. And then another question I have for you, another um, War Studies applicant, who notes that their GPA is below 3.7 um, due to extenuating circumstances one semester. Um, and they say that their academic record after that shows a lot of improvement. Um, would they still be a competitive applicant? If you can, that's something that's worth explaining in your personal statement, right? If you can give us the context for why your GPA is below a 3.7, if, if that's the case, if you don't have a 3.7, but you're a fantastic writer, you give a great interview, um, and we think you'll contribute to the conversation in the classroom, and you can handle the workload, right? Because that's, that's really what the GPA is sort of a proxy for is, are you a hard worker, and can you handle the heavy workload that we put on you for the program? If there are mitigating circumstances that prove that, yes, that's the case, even if you don't have a 3.7 GPA, then we have brought in people with a, with a lower GPA who sort of tick all the other boxes. Yeah, and that's definitely true for other Hertog fellowships as well. We don't um, have a minimum GPA listed um, in our programs like War Studies does, although I would say, you know, most um, competitive applicants are 3.7 or higher as with War Studies, um, but I definitely take into account also your coursework. Um, I like to see grit, like if you take statistics and it's really hard and you just like grit your teeth, but you get through it, but it dings your GPA. I like to see that more than um, 
you're taking less challenging coursework, shall we say. Like if you've been wrestling with ancient Greek, I like that. Um, so, and then of course, if you have extenuating circumstances, it's always um, helpful to include that as a note in your um, personal statement. All right, I think we have a, can um, a question from Alexander LaFrance, who I believe is going to be beamed up momentarily. Hi, Alexander. Hello. Hi, uh, how are you? Good, how are you? Great, thank you for joining um, us. Th thank you for having me. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, my first question is what precisely qualifies as a young professional? Um, for example, could someone who is fresh out of graduate school but hasn't been in uh, undergrad in, say, about five to six years, do they qualify as young professional? Is this aimed more for... I guess, younger professionals. Yeah, so my rule of thumb is generally 35 and under. Um, okay. So if you meet that, then I, I still think of you as young. Um, so Fantastic. Uh, okay. Great. Any other? Uh, I think you had a second question as well. Yes. And for the writing sample, um, the application, it sounds like you're looking more for rhetorical skill, um, but still centered on an academic discipline. Um, if you haven't been in a situation that's required you to write a traditional essay, but you've uh, written a research paper, for example, um, is that eligible? Are figures acceptable like in a science publication? Um, or would it be more appropriate to rewrite something in more of an academic essay style? Sure. I, I think the writing sample will differ, um, especially given, you know, the security studies wide um, eligibility, which is that we're going to have undergraduates, we're going to have graduate students applying, um, young professionals, and they're going to have different kinds of writing. So like if you're a young professional and you work in a policy context, it's perfectly acceptable to send in um, a policy memo that you wrote, perhaps um, something that you worked on as part of your job. Um, I, I, Alexander, I'm not sure about what you, what might be the best piece of writing for you to showcase, um, but I definitely would accept work um, from your graduate study. Um, if there's something that you've written, you know, professionally or maybe for, you know, a broader public audience, um, you know, an op-ed or um, some kind of policy analysis, that would also be acceptable to send. So it doesn't have to be an academic paper. I generally encourage people to submit an academic paper because that's usually the most polished writing that they have, um, rather than like maybe your column for the school newspaper. Um, but you know that's not always the case. So you have to use a little bit of judgment um, when thinking about how to put your best foot forward. Excellent, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you, Alexander. And I think, just we have a question from Andre. Is he going to show himself or would he like me to ask it? We have silence, so I will, I will ask on behalf of Andre. I'm sorry, Andre, if I'm, I'm stealing your thunder. Um, this is a question for you, Brian, um, and he's wondering if there um, are any speakers that come from the intelligence community or maybe the Senate on Foreign Relations. So not for this particular program, um, but what I will say is uh, if you become a member of the Hertog War Studies Program cohort, we then actually offer subsequent advanced programs where we will bring people back for three to four days uh, and we'll do deep dives on other military history or contemporary topics. And for those, we will have outside guest speakers beyond uh, the senior military folks that we have for the, the core war studies program. Uh, but for the core war studies program, it is uh, skewed toward those in uniform as the guest speakers. Oh, and I believe that Andre has another question pertaining to the writing sample. Um, Andre, do you wanna make yourself known? Jess can um, make you a panelist so that you can appear. Great. Hello. Sorry yes, about hello, that. Andre. We can hear you, Andre. Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, good evening. So there is always something that I'm not particularly understanding in the context of sending these kind of niche writing samples. Right? You've you've told the story of being inspired by a peculiar, unusual type of essay pertaining to business princesses and whatever else. Right. So in that context, what is more 
competitive? Is it some type of originality, such as sending a writing sample that compares um, Mongolian legacies and warfare with German idealism, for example, or something more conventional, such as a geopolitical logistics paper? So it, we really do give you the latitude for you to decide what constitutes your best writing, right? That we, we leave that open on purpose uh, for you to make that judgment call. And the examples you listed would all be acceptable submissions, right? It just depends on what you think uh, best encapsulates your ability to put pen to paper and convey ideas to a reader. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Great. And Scooter is um, joining us. I think we've got one, time for one more question. So I'll, and this one is for you, Brian. Um, the student um, says they're an ROTC cadet um, and wants to apply to war studies, but they don't know their summer training dates yet, which I think is a common conundrum for these students. If they were selected to war studies um, and they then find out there's a conflict with their training dates, how would you handle that? Could they get a deferral? So it depends on what year you are, um, as far as whether a deferral would be in the realm of the possible, because um, if, say, you're a rising senior and you then had a conflict, well, then you could absolutely, because you'd still be eligible to reapply the following year, right, to, to come in 2024 instead of 2023. Um, what we have found is actually, um, so far, um, when there have been these kinds of conflicts, the students have been able to work it out. Um, and often with ROTC programs, you can literally trade slots with somebody else. Um, to, to give you a little of my background, I ran the ROTC program at the University of Delaware for a year when I was uh, uh, a major in the army. And so there's some latitude to shift things around if you get creative and work with your cadre if you get picked and there is a conflict, often you can get that worked out um, so that you remove the conflict. And I, I misspoke. We have one more question just tells me, Benjamin Duff, Duffy Howard, who's been waiting very patiently. So he's coming up, will appear shortly. There we go, Benjamin. Hello. Hi, Benjamin. Yes, hello. All right. Uh, so yeah, my question has to do with like, do you guys keep track of where people end up professionally after either the war studies or the security studies programs? Like, is there a general trend or is there kind of a diversity in the uh, places that people end up? Why don't you go first, um, Brian, and then I'll plug in. Sure. So the Herzog War Studies program at this point has about 200 alumni. And what we've seen is that they do go in very diverse directions, right? We certainly have people who end up in academia on the path to becoming university professors. We have lots who go into the national security apparatus, whether that's uh, working on Capitol Hill as a staffer, uh, in the executive branch, um, you know, working often within the intelligence community, those kinds of things. But we also see people in business at the intersection of technology and national security. So people will be in sort of the venture capital space working on issues that pertain to national security. Um, but all told, what we found in our surveys of alumni is that something like 85% end up in either public sector, public service, or adjacent to public sector, public service. Um, and so it's actually uh, a fairly small subset that ends up in, you know, traditional business that is in no way associated with the national security space. Yeah, and security studies is a new program, so we don't yet have alumni from that program, um, but the total Hertog alumni number over 1600, and there's a really wide diversity given the broad range of our programs. We have students who go into academia, we have students who go into business, we have a lot of students in national security and journalism, working on the Hill and government, um, in the intelligence community, you name it, a Hertog student is probably doing it. Um, so. The, if you're interested in some kind of career path, there's probably a Herzog program for you. Um, so that's all the time that we have for questions, but you all should feel free to reach out by email. Again, our um, deadline is March 1st. 
So get your applications in. We are, I'm going to turn things over now to Brian um, and also our guest, Scooter Libby. Great. Thanks so much, Cheryl. So it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's guest, Lewis Scooter Libby, the Senior Vice President of the Hudson Institute, who guides the Institute's program on national security and defense issues. Before joining Hudson, he held several high positions in the federal government, including Chief of Staff to Vice President Cheney and Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, among other positions in both the executive and legislative branches. Prior to joining federal service, Mr. Libby served as the managing partner of the Washington Office of the International Law Firm, Deshert. Mr. Libby has several notable publications and lectures on national and homeland security, including a novel set in early 20th century Japan called The Apprentice. So the format for this evening is I'll begin by asking a few set, uh, questions of Mr. Libby, and then I'll cede the floor to the audience for questions. If you could please submit your questions uh, using the Zoom Q&A feature found at the bottom menu bar. You can start submitting questions now. There's no need to wait. If your question is selected, Jess will contact you via chat and ask you to be ready to turn on your camera so you can address your question directly to Mr. Libby. All right, well, again, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, I'll start with a nice softball. Uh, what do you think is the most pressing national security challenge facing the United States today, Mr. Libby? Uh, thanks, Brian, for the question. Um, I'm a little bit amused by write your questions before anyone has said anything. This is a very Washington <laughs> thing, I think. It's a great precedent for people. Any future journalists uh, in the audience, right? Exactly. So um, the greatest threat, I'd say, uh, let me talk about um, two categories. On the national security side, I would say China is the, clearly the greatest threat. Um, it's hostile. It's interesting, if you look at the CIA's um, world source book, where they gather statistics on countries, uh, remember, this is our CIA. Uh, the Chinese economy is listed as being 15% greater than ours. So it's not a matter of 10, 15 years off. Now, this is on a purchasing power parity mode. And I do recall that the CIA's effort to uh, judge the size of the Soviet economy was way off. So it's possible there's good news behind this statistic, but this, this is what we're putting out to the world, which is an interesting messaging process. Second on the national security side, I would say I've been concerned about uh, biological warfare for a long time. Um, it's fashionable now. It wasn't so fashionable back when I first started it, uh, when we were worried in 1990 about what um, Saddam Hussein might do. 1990, remember I said, that's the first Gulf War. So the possibilities for that, which I first studied in college, uh, includes anonymous warfare, where you bring the agent in and no one really knows who does it, so it's very hard to retaliate. It's very hard to retaliate anyway for us, um, given that we're not about to nuke a place and we have we don't have what biological weapons of our own. The um, consequences of an attack like that would be enormous and there's not much readily that we can do other than improve our defenses. On the uh, the other side though, which is new, I don't think this would have made my list five, 10 years ago, um, is America's domestic situation. Um, debt destroys nations, that's just a matter of history and we're running up a lot. Uh, we are divided in a way that um, some would say is the worst since the 19, late 1960s. Some get more dramatic and go before that. Uh, but in any case, we have both divisions and also something new, which is a great questioning of our national story and of our strength as a people. That has a great undermining effect, I'm afraid, on our willingness to, um, to ready ourselves. And we seem to be now facing a threat greater in many ways, I guess all but one way, than the Soviet Union. There were times in the early part of the conflict with the Soviet Union when we were convinced it was a great technological threat. 
That turned out not to be true, but for a long time, we were very concerned about it. Uh, China, though, does seem to pose that type of threat. We may, you know, hopefully we will surpass them in the way we did the Soviets, but, um, but that's an enormous threat and we are not attending to even the technological side of it the way we should be as a domestic issue. So those would be at the top of my list. No, thank you for that. Um, what experience from your decades of service to the nation are you proudest of? Uh, so this is sort of setting me up, Brian. Uh, I appreciate the spirit <laughs> of it. Um, you know, well, gee, Scoot, come out and brag in front of all these people. This is um, uh, not something I'm usually doing, and I'll probably avoid it here. Let me say that, uh, let me talk about some other folk who have accomplished things that I think are notable and perhaps meaningful for um, people at the starting end of the career. Um, in the Carter administration, there was a young academic who went into the government uh, and he was asked to look at the Middle East and he determined that there was an enormous threat that could strike into the Gulf where our energy supplies are based. And he looked at two places in particular, um, the threat from the, the Soviets, um, but also the threat coming out of the Middle East. And he looked at this problem and he realized that there was no way we could get forces there in time to defend. So he sat down and thought about the combination of these issues and decided the answer was to preposition forces. We'd put tanks and materials on, on a ship, park the ship somewhere nearby. And then when the crisis came, you bring the ship in and you fly in your troops and you could um, have force on the ground much faster than you could in any other fashion. So this guy's name was Paul Wolfowitz. He had come out of teaching at Yale. Um, he was a very, he was an academic. Um, and, uh, but for what he did, we would not have been able to stop Saddam Hussein in 1990. Saddam Hussein, if he had wished, could have gone down into the Saudi oil fields. So there was a guy who just came out of academia, I assume not so different from many of the people um, who are listening to this today, except, you know, he's a pretty smart guy, so he could be smarter than one or two of them. And he figured this out and he put it into practice and, um, and it saved lives and saved our national security position. There's a postscript to this. Um, when we were in the Pentagon in 1990, after Saddam had in fact invaded into Kuwait and was threatening to invade into Saudi Arabia, putting troops down to the south, um, we were able to, to match those forces uh, and to deter them. But the interesting thing I wanted to point out was six months before the invasion, actually maybe more like eight months before the invasion, the Joint Staff decided that they were going to take um, a contingency in Southwest Asia off of the planning scenarios. Now the planning scenarios, as you know, are the way in which the joint staff and the services plan the forces they will need. So putting it on the planning scenario means you start doing plans, you start figuring out what forces would get there, you do tip fiddles, you know, these things which tell you in what order you would deliver troops. It's a lot of work that goes into it. And the joint staff in January of 1990, maybe it was a little earlier than that, maybe late 1989, was taking Iraq off of that list. Now, you can imagine both the public relations problems and also the real world problems that would have uh, happened if that had occurred. And Paul Wolfowitz, the guy who had set this up, now happened to be the undersecretary for policy. And he had a, a guy who was in his first days in the Pentagon meet and sent me in to tell a room full of people with four stars on their shoulders that they were crazy and they couldn't do what they wanted to do. So that was, it, it seared into my memory that day. No, that's so great. Thank maybe you one, for that. one other example, perhaps, um, there's a brilliant academic named Harry Rowan. He had been president of Rand, so he wasn't as young as Wolfowitz was. But after Saddam Hussein invaded, Harry Rowan 
uh, went off on vacation and read a book. And he was reading about the history of invasions in that part of the world. And Rowan realized that whereas all of our um, planning was to come up from the South, that historically the way the Brits had attacked was from the West. And so he came up with the idea we should attack from the West, which was eventually we had to do a lot of work on it. We changed the scope of it. Um, for one thing, I don't think it would have been wise. The attack from the West that the Brits did would have put them right outside of Baghdad. And we really didn't want to go into Baghdad. So it would have been a bluff. And I never thought that was wise. But we did change it to be a shallower left hook, which became the famous and very successful um, offensive operation. So there are two guys out of academia um, using a basically academic methods who thought their way through problems. So the last question I'll ask before I open it up to uh, the questions that are starting to come in, thank you for those who've started asking them, um, is what's the advice you would give students in this early stage of their career? Or another way to ask it is, what do you wish 20 year old Scooter had known when you were in their shoes? Uh, limit your tequila intake. I guess I would say uh, two of the most successful people I know in government, uh, they were controversial, but they certainly succeeded in getting to where they wanted to get were uh, Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And they both had similar advice uh, for people, which was um, put your head down and do your job and, if, and do it well and everything will work out. So I think that's not a bad bit of advice. Um, I would also say though that all good advice is contradictory. So um, there's another bit of advice that Mrs. Cheney gives Lynn Cheney, who was head of the National Endowment for the Humanities, I believe, for a while, very smart scholar. And she would say there may be people who are the best at what they do who don't love it, but I've never met one. So mm -hmm. if your goal is to be the best at what you do, pick something you love. No, I think that's great advice. So at this point, I've got a number of questions in the queue, um, and I will start uh, with one from an anonymous uh, student who says, I'm thinking about going to law school as a stepping stone to working in government. Um, do you think your legal training was helpful in your government work, and would you recommend law school to someone who wants to work in national security? Hmm. Uh, very complicated question. Thanks. Um, I thought my legal training uh, was very useful um, because a great deal of, of national security is bureaucratics. So a lot of it, half the problem is figuring out one, where you want to go, but the other half is getting it accepted by other people and getting it implemented. And that is very much like different forms of arbitration or litigation in which you have to marshal evidence, present cases, maybe occasionally know when not to present a case, pose questions that move things in the right direction. So that training was very useful, but unfortunately, the important part of that training did not come from law school. It comes from private practice. And, and in my case, I was at some big litigation firms. Um, big firms have the advantage that they can afford to do things thoroughly, do them right, so I think that if you want to get this benefit, it's not a three-year commitment, it's a seven-year commitment. The three years of law school and then three or four years of practice in a big law firm. And that will give you um, some skills that you can carry on through life if you decide you run out of opportunities in the government. Um, I was able to move in and out a couple of times. Having said that, there's no guarantee that if you go to law school and go into a law firm, you're going to then get a government job. My opportunity came completely out of the blue. And uh, no one would say that's a good way to plan a career. So. Great. 
So uh, the next question is from Grace. Grace, if you want to unmute yourself and turn on your camera, you can ask your questions. Hi, Scooter. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, are Russia and China mutually exclusive challenges? I'm wondering if there's any um, grounds to the claim that concentrating on one great power is a distraction from the other. Um, you know, are there ways to manage both of those challenges uh, at once? And my second question is, <laughs> how did positive public support for the war in Ukraine blossom so quickly um, in the US? Like what caused everyone to buy a Ukraine flag and put it in their front yard? What, what, how did they, how did we generate that? Um, well, great to see you. Um, I'm more used to you providing me with answers, not asking me questions. You're supposed to be sending me things. So it seems unfair. Um, let me see on the Russia, China problem. You know, it would be really nice if you could um, uh, concentrate on one problem at a time in life. It doesn't usually work that way. Uh, exclusive focus on one is probably a mistake. On the other hand, you do have to prior prioritize. So um, uh, in the current arrangement of things, I think China is the greater threat as I started out with, but it doesn't mean you can, you have the luxury to ignore the Russian threat or the WMD threat for that matter. So uh, the truth is we're in a particularly dangerous period, which is would not be news to people who lived in the 1940s. It would be news to people who lived in the 1920s because they were blissful idiots, but it didn't mean that it wasn't about to come down on their head, you know? So uh, we've had this 30 year period where everything was just hunky dory and we can throw stuff off the side of the boat without worrying about it. It probably has come to an end. Um, now, there are people who say, well, during the Cold War, we spent 6% on GDP. Now we're spending, what, 3% 3, 3 of GDP on defense? Um, you know, maybe we need to up it. The, the real truth is, in the Cold War, the 6% was never adequate unless you wanted to go to nuclear war. The 6% got us to the point where we could start a nuclear war. It didn't get us to the point where we could finish a war without a nuclear war. So. You know, it's defense is a very serious business, which takes a lot of resources. And if you don't want to pay it, you may get lucky or you may pay the price. The second question about how did people rally to Ukraine? Uh, well, it's a very interesting question. And I think um, actually the people in this audience could probably answer it as well or better than I can. I rallied immediately because I was around in 19, in the early 1990s when we promised the Ukrainians, if you give us your nuclear weapons, if you get rid of them, we, we and the Russians agree we will defend you. Well, that promise doesn't look very good if you're a Ukrainian in retrospect. So it seemed to me an awful moral failing and one likely to encourage any other power to think we better get those. As Tom Ware says, you know, we better get those weapons. So um, why did the general public, well, I think there's the, the first there was, um, there's a little bit of retroactive looking, I think, going on here. At first, I think a lot of people's attitude was, you're gonna lose, just get it over with. You know? When they proved stalwart, then I think a little bit of this sort of Churchillian sort of sense of, we have to defend these folk, the vestigial memory of what happened in Munich came along. And I think at that point, people began to say, well, these guys are standing up to it. They were putting, you know, 20th century media, 21st century media has a huge impact on this. These, you know, mothers in basements with their children were talking to you in your living room about this is awful and we just want our freedom. Pretty appealing stuff. So, um, there are occasions where sentiment leads a country to do the wrong thing. I personally, my view is that in this case, sentiment led us to do the right thing. 
a follow-up question, which I will give to you, is whether people are going to stick with it. Whether the Ukrainians can, they're under terrible pressure, especially in the East, and whether they will continue to tough it out as we dole out weapons at a what we consider a safe pace is a big question. But a second big question is whether the Americans, after spending you know billions and billions, are going to want to keep doing it. And there are parts of our body politic which doesn't. So I think the the conventional wisdom on this, or the the right way to phrase this, would then be, you know, don't change the dial. Watch this station. We'll see whether people stick with it. Yeah, it Great. definitely raises questions about how long this will go on. But thank you for your answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say this is not going to stop. Um, even if in the near term you get a truce, as long as Putin or Putin right people are in charge of Russia, they'll just take another whack at the apple. That's what they've done this time. They took the first one in 2014, they came back for a second one. I met recently with a, I'll make it vague, a, a Central European general who said, This isn't going to stop. They'll just come back. I think he's right. Great. So our next question comes from Alexander LaFrance. Are you, is he coming in to ask it live or am I asking it for him? There we go. He's coming in now. Hi, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, so my question was, uh, particularly since you had mentioned uh, biological threats, um, and I think regarding CBRN threats in general, uh, what can people with a STEM background do to contribute to national security efforts? How can we play a role on that? Um, well, I would say uh, it's a very good time to ask the question. It's probably an easier answer today than it's been for a very long time. Uh, because the the weaponry is changing rapidly. We tend to forget how rapidly weaponry changed in the past, but I think it is true now that we're on the cusp of um, with AI and possibly quantum uh, and with um, new developments in the, on the biological side uh, coming at a, a increasingly fast rate. I believe we are at a period when the STEM capabilities will be um, critical. And this goes back to the very first question Brian asked. Uh, China is turning out uh, engineers much faster than we are. If you add in Western Europe to our numbers, assuming that's a fair thing to do, uh, we do better. Um, but we have a real technological challenge here. And whereas brilliance counts, the number of people involved in some of these projects also counts. So technologists at the brilliant end and technologists in the middle end, if that's a, if that's a term, uh, both of them are going to be very, very useful. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, a, another career-related question we have from an anonymous attendee is, would you say that skills from a communications degree, marketing, media, advertising, are those relevant for someone interested in working in national security and the study of war? Well, there are important communications jobs in national security and, um, and, and um, both in implementing policy uh, and in some extent in uh, crafting policy. If you craft a policy that the public won't, won't um, support and won't continue with, or if you craft a policy that they support and then you screw up the explanation so they won't continue with it, uh, you can do great harm. So there is a great need for those skills. It is an element, but it's only one element of getting to the right policy. So um, I'm not one who believes that the communications people should drive the policy. I do believe they should be advising as to you know, what, how the policy can be handled. It's interesting that, at least to me, that uh, Karl Rove was asked what was the biggest mistake 
he had made in his time in the Bush 43 White House. And he said it was the failure, not just failure, but the, po the, the, the decided policy not to answer charges that the president had lied about WMD in, in Iraq. Um, the thinking in the, among the communicators at the time was, look, the president hadn't lied. It should be pretty obvious to everybody he had lied. The CIA documents that explained what he thought he had were clear. And if we hang on this story, it just perpetuates it. In fact, by not responding to that story, it became accepted wisdom. And that undermined the public's interest in continuing the war. So it had a very detrimental effect, which is why Carl called it the biggest mistake he made. Where better communications advice would have had a strong national security implication. So I'm going to ask the final question because we only have time for just a little bit more. Um, people often say that the best leaders are readers. And I'm curious what's on your bookshelf right now or on your nightstand that you would recommend to students who are interested in understanding national security? What's, what's one book recommendation you would give them? Um, let me give you a two-part answer. Um, when I don't know that I'm the best person to respond to this, but when people like uh, Henry Kissinger and Andy Marshall, the defense intellectual, have been asked about this, their answer is history, history, history. So on the question of what you should do, history. There is a second part to this art form, which I, I've been calling implementation, which is, okay, now you've got an idea as to what you should be doing, but how do you get the government to do it? And how do you get the government to execute it properly with regard to foreign parties? And for that part, I think the Peter Rodman book, um, Presidential Command is very good. There are others. <clears throat> Kissinger has a recent book out, Readership, which basically history about six great readers, which people might find of interest. His White House Years is a terrific book um, as well. I, I shouldn't end a, a session for the Institute of the Study of War which out, without pointing out one of the most impressive bits of national security work that's been done. And it was done by Fred and Kim Kagan. Um, when as people in a private think tank, they helped win a war. There's not a lot of that going around, you know? First of all, there's not a lot of winning wars anymore to begin with, but their work on um, their understanding and then their deep, dedicated research and uh, look into the causes of the problem of the Iraq insurgency and their prescriptions for how to solve it played a very important role in getting to the solution. Um, there were other areas, there are other places that were trying to do it. There were people in the White House who were trying to get there. There were people in uh, Forcecom who were getting there, David Petraeus, who I think your, your position is named after, I think, uh, did enormous work. But for civilians on the outside, joined with General Jack Keane, that's really an amazing accomplishment. And uh, if people wanna think of things that would inspire them to go into public service, there's a pretty good one, and you don't have to take a government salary to do it. So. Well, Scooter, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a real pleasure to facilitate this conversation, both between you and me and then with the students. Um, you've given them lots of good advice and things to think about. And uh, with that, uh, we will call it a day. And thank you very much. It's been great to have thank everyone you. on. Thank you very much for being here this evening, everyone. And we look forward to your applications for both uh, the Hertog War Studies program and the Security Studies program.